Hey, welcome and welcome back to the stash. Today we are back to having a look at whatever they're doing over at the Amazing Spider-Man comic series. Like each fortnight, I'm baffled to see that this series is still even going, especially considering no one is buying these issues. I mean, there is some hope that after issue 50, Zeb Wells will finally be done with the series, but who really knows? Anyway, before we get into the video, I just wanted to tell you that I have a pretty big video on the way about going over why Zeb Wells is the worst Spider-Man writer we've ever seen and all that lovely stuff. I want to make that one first, but it just needs a little bit more time, and I didn't want to leave you guys hanging, so here we are. And also, while we're on the topic of self-promotion, we are so close to 1,100 subscribers, so if you like Spider-Man or comic content in general, feel free to stick around and maybe hit that subscribe button. Anyway, with that being said, let's get straight back into the video. So just in case you haven't been keeping up with the uploads, like if you there is a playlist, I'll give you a quick recap. With the gang war at an end and the city safe once more for both civilians and superheroes, Spider-Man can finally focus on the people close to him. That includes Anna Watson, the aunt of his ex, and still good friend Mary Jane. Wait, still good f friend. Are you serious? Who do you think you're even fooling at this point? Anyway, Anna took Krakone medicine, I think is how you pronounce it. I completely forgot about that as well. Like, this really is the most forgettable Spider-Man run. Anyway, it had dramatically improved the health, but unfortunately the anti-mutant organization Orcus hacked into it to cause some of the people who took the medicine to go insane. And unlucky for Aunt Anna because obviously that included her. She now resides in Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane, among the worst criminals New York has ever seen. Now what's funny to me is how this story plot was actually introduced way back in the series, uh, in its first annual issue, which was about seven months ago, I'd like to say. So they totally just didn't forget about it at all, didn't they? It's pretty embarrassing, if anything, because Zeb Wells even shoehorned a stupid wreck rap story before even getting back to this. Anyway, if he doesn't care, why should I? Now, our story begins with what seems to be a normal day at Ravencroft, however, unknown to those inside, a certain Arachnid is not where he's supposed to be. I mean, thank god they've finally swapped artists. Even though I love John Romita Jr., don't get me wrong, especially his work in the 90s and 2000s, he just isn't that good anymore. All of his stuff in this series looks so stiff and unnatural or just hideously proportioned. This artist, however, is much better, and the way she actually draws Spidey in this is really cool to look at, so at least there's a positive there. As we continue, the nurse finally makes her way to Anna Watson, where we can see she's still stuck in that aggressive state she was in last time. Remember how she also beat up Spider-Man? Yeah, me neither. Afterwards, Spidey shows himself to Miss Watson and explains he has a cure here ready for her, and at first she calls him a perv, then a junkie, then somehow catches him off guard and bites his hand. Luckily, Spider-Man still has one functional brain cell remaining and proceeds to stab Anna with the cure, making her return to her former self. Peter tells Anna that he's going to break her out of prison, because that always goes well, doesn't it? I have to help you! <laughs> you tased me, bro! However, she knows that at the end of the day, she still did a wrongful act and explains to Spider-Man that it's her responsibility to pay her debt for society. But for now, I guess I'm on Aunt Anna's side. I mean, how are you going to explain a jailbreak even with the best lawyers? So, uh, Mr. Spider-Man, did you or did you not break Miss Watson out of prison, as shown in the security footage? Um... Well, you see, um, fuck. Later on, Peter meets up with Norman Osborn to pretty much tell him he's quitting his job at Oscorp. Norman assumes it was because of his absence during the gang war, but Peter assures him it's about what he actually said to him earlier in the series. You see, after the whole Goblin Sin storyline, Norman Osborn has been acting a little bit weird. He's been trying to repress that little green goblin voice in his head, but each day he just gets that little bit bigger. And by the end of the conversation, though, Norman sort of snaps out of it and tells Peter that he can work for him and come and go as he pleases with a full rate of salary. Peter then gives Norman this, like, puppy-eyed thank you look, which is just, it's so, so wrong on so many levels, especially if you know their history. Jesus Christ. We also see that in a part of Oscorp, Dr. Connors is working and researching on the living brain. Let's just hope this idiot showing stupid Carl his new e-bike doesn't, I don't know, awake the living brain? 
I mean, seriously, how dumb do you have to be to bring your phone in an area where it's strictly no digital devices because if so, it could awake the most troublesome supercomputer ever to exist? Sometimes I swear they just write the civilians of the Marvel Universe to be the, the most dumbest people on Earth. It's incredible. Especially in the early 60s. Don't even get me started. They'll see Spider-Man and like form a, like a massive crown around him, try to rip his suit off, and then he'll like jump out of the way because he doesn't want to show his identity to everyone or just get beaten up by a bunch of strangers. And then they'll call him a menace and say he doesn't appreciate his fans. Like, the Marvel... So the civilians of the Marvel world need to be studied. There's no way they are, I don't know, like, functional members of society. It's just they don't act like how they're supposed to. Spider-Man and Mary Jane plan to meet up to go visit Aunt Anna together. However, in typical Parker fashion, he's late. But this time, so was Mary Jane, because now, in case you forgot Lucky You, I'm sorry I have to remind you about this, she's now a superhero called Jackpot. God, I hate this comic. I can't express how stupid and, and pointless it was to make Mary Jane become a superhero. Her being a normal person was one of her strong points as a character, and it gave her so many special moments to shine in. I mean, off the top of my head, I can think about just even a couple moments like her standing up against her stalker in the 90s, or even just shooting Green Goblin on the bridge, and it just proved that she didn't actually need powers to be someone strong and inspiring, but now it's just, ugh. MJ didn't have powers? Pff, quickly, let's milk that jackpot line for everything it's got. Now in Ravencroft, we can see Aunt Anna is actually pretty friendly with all the villains and actually knows most by name. Peter, being rightfully confused, explains that people like Whirlwind are not nice young men, and for Anna to reply with not everyone had the same opportunities as you did, Peter, it, it, it's baffling to me. Let me get this straight. Anna Watson is excusing someone like Whirlwind of... Let me just get his criminal record up one sec <clears throat> mass destruction theft attempted murder terrorism aiding and abetting assault jailbreak kidnapping breaking and entering and hostage taking all because he what wasn't loved as a child or something if anything i remember him having like a half decent life before going to crime peter was an orphan who grew up with his aunt and uncle and his uncle got murdered in cold blood because of one of his actions not, not to mention the countless mind-breaking experience peter's been through during his career as spider-man and he still manages to do the right thing most of the time but Wilwyn gets a pass from aunt anna are you what what am i reading it'd be funny if it weren't so pathetic no, what the heck, I'll laugh anyway. <laughs> also, can Zeb Wells just make up his mind about whose fault it was with Peter and Mary Jane breaking up? I mean, in this issue, it goes back to being Mary Jane's fault, but before I could have sworn it was Peter's fault, and there was another time, like, last time I'm pretty sure Peter said it wasn't anyone's fault, and I can't be bothered, man, this book is such a mess. Sadly, moving on, Peter wanders off to go talk to Sandman, and, and Flint explains that he turned himself in and that he really wants to reform, but being made up of so many individual sand pieces means each one sort of thinks differently. Some really want to be a good person, while other parts of him just want to embrace being the Sandman. He continues by asking Peter who his friend was, and with him stupidly replying with Spider-Man. This was a big mistake. This sets off the evil part in Sandman, and he lashes out in fury, but luckily, Ravencroft equipped him with this device that can sort of contain him and uh, stop him from just breaking out of prison. Anyone else noticed how much this issue is sort of taken from the opening of the Amazing Spider-Man uh, movie game? First the attempt to jailbreak, then Peter not knowing to keep distance with the patients causing them to get angry, just... I mean, I could be imagining things, but it just seems really similar to me. But just as Peter and Mary Jane are about to get kicked out, Flint quickly grabs Peter's arm to warn him, or to warn Spidey I should say, that the Sinister Six are planning to unleash the Sandman and get him to rejoin the deadly group of villains. Now I'm not really sure where to begin with this one. I mean this book was pretty boring to read and if anything it was just like filler for whatever comes next. Zeb Wells tackling the Sinister Six again seems like a pretty bold move because if done right it's always a great read, but if done wrong... Well, let's just say that's a pretty damaging thing to do to your career. I mean, to be fair, you made a name for yourself by just actually actively ruining your writing career by doing this series, so who knows, maybe he wanted like, just add this one to his belt as well. Now, this comic to me feels pretty out of place, and like, majority of this story feels like it would have been better suited, like, just half a year early. Like, letting this just sit in the files of story plots we'll eventually get to makes this whole story seem pointless. Like, how am I supposed to be invested in something that the writer doesn't even care about? 
Zeb Wells just uses this comic as an excuse to continue the character assassination of Mary Jane Watson, and if you've seen the latest rumors, it explains a lot, especially with how pathetic Zeb Wells is as a person and as a writer. What sucks even more is just how it feels like we may have gone back to the will they won't they stage of what I'm guessing is meant to be the attempt of a redemption for Wells' entire run, as he finally gives everyone what they wanted and puts Pete and Mary Jane back together, while completely ignoring how badly he screwed up over her character just to create the problem in the first place. Again, if you know, you know. But even with that being said, the whole thing of Peter being friends with Mary Jane just doesn't even feel natural at all to me. Not, not much time has even passed and he's just over it? Like, she was pretty brutal to him when she came back with Paul, intentional or not. And also, I'm still waiting for the day that MJ will finally take any form of accountability on ruining her relationship with Peter every single time they broke up. It's just, it's always like this, uh, her being on the moral high ground while Peter just gets humiliated and, and never calls her out on her bullshit, and I just can't stand how Marvel has been writing her out of character for over a decade now. It shouldn't seem like she's doing, a Peter, uh, she's doing Peter a favor whenever she's dating him. If anything, it should be the other way around, because without Peter, Mary Jane wouldn't have grown the way she did as a character from the 70s to the 2000s, but who cares about consistent writing? Who cares about all the lore that was previously within this books, and just who cares about making a good story anymore? I mean, I get that someday they can be friends, but they have some serious unsaid issues to work out, and Peter right now should be realistically grey rocking her. The whole nice guy to the point where you get belittled every two seconds syndrome shows that they can't even evolve Peter out of his high school screw up everything character, and I'm just... I'm so tired. I I'm so tired of, of this character being trapped within the confinements of his teenager self. Not, not even his real teenage personality in the 60s where he was just an asshole to everyone. No, they're not that generous. He's stuck in the new Disney-fied Peter, where he's just a complete pushover and is afraid to have any form of confrontation. When, when it comes to what to do next with the amazing Spider-Man title that's fresh and captivating, I fail to see how Marvel continuously mess it up. It's, it's not rocket science, in, in fact it's actually pretty simple. Just let Peter grow up.